blanking here. <laughs> it's fun when you blank on stage. Cause it's kind of like it's like having a stroke. <laughs> or maybe not. Well, I don't know. I mean, have you, you know what having a stroke is really like? Have you ever been in a European country like Belgium and had to use a keyboard in the business center? <laughs> and you look at it and like, oh, this is what my grandparents went through. And we were talking about, oh, th patterns that emerge from telling stories. Right. Well, yeah, it's not just in this book, but collectively as a culture, the stories we tell reveal things about us. I mean, look at... I mean, do we tell the same stories in Canada as the States? No, we have our own different set of stories. And they're inventing these new, weird, uh, really mutated, freaky ones right now. And in them, we're seeing a larger pattern emerge. I, I think that it's, you know, I don't know what school of thought it belongs to, but looking at, at stories as just a pure information and what you can glean from them, I think that's one way of looking at it. Mm. Um, you, you have brought up Marshall McLuhan a couple of times, and I do want to raise something that um, uh, Jane Piper said in the Toronto Star on Sunday. Um, somebody said to her, as as you did at the beginning of this conversation, "What is it that library? What do librarians do? And what do libraries do? You know, mm -hmm. now that everybody can sit at home and access Google Books and Google Scholar, instead of why come here?" And obviously. This is one of the reasons people come here, is to have a conversation uh, that approximates a, you know, something you might have in your living room, but with a lot of people around, yeah. which is kind of a new thing. But McC Jane said, it's not, I wrote it down, it's not the container that matters, it's what's in it. But Marshall disagreed completely with that. Marshall said that what it, the shape of the container is a, very, a huge determinant of what's in it. Did he not? So if you change the shape of the library, do you not change the content of it? Well, you could also look at it the other way. He said the medium is the message, so the shape of the container is the message. So that thing can cut both ways. I think the issue with libraries, um, for me, libraries are about, they begin with that part in your life younger, I mean, maybe around end of elementary, early high school, where you really grow, you, you sort of, you move into yourself, you, you withdraw. I mean, anyone who, you know, that's what teenagers do. And you start feeding, your brain just starts to feed and feed, and you, you start going through sections of the library. And, you, and there's a very real sense of absorbing or becoming a part of a larger culture. And I don't know if that happens anymore. I hope it does. It may well. I don't know. But for me, that's what a library does. And uh, uh, I, I would never actually think of, uh, I don't think of libraries as town hall type situations like we have here. Uh, I'm, I'm glad we're doing this. Uh, I'm continuing. Sorry, I'm babbling. No, 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 you're not you're, yeah, at all. You're, I think you are describing what the library is, is, is in fact uh, becoming. Um, I, we want to get to some questions, um, and it's, it's nearly 10 to 8. Um, but I, I did want to, if I could, um, I have a couple of quick things I need. You have a huge, reader, a huge readership. Um, how many books have you sold in total? I have no idea. I really don't. Have you made a lot of money? <laughs> I would have made a lot more if A, books or libraries didn't exist. <laughs> so I've subsidized this place in my own special way. Yeah. Uh, has, have, yeah, I presume you have made enough money to, to, to pretty much do what you want. Has that been a great, a great freedom? I imagine it has to a writer such as yourself who seems to travel, take in all sorts mm. of the world, spend a lot of time writing. Well, I mean, all, it, all any of that affords you is the time to continue doing what you're doing. I mean, I haven't had any big change, change in game plan or anything. Uh, you know, the, the other side of it, Ian, is that I started doing this. And I only began writing in 1987. And that was just, it, it was not something that was planned. And 
and I don't know if it's something that's planable. And, you know, there was a large part of my life and I felt like I'd sold the family cow for three beans. You know, it's a risk. It's self-employment. There's no guarantee that anything's going to happen tomorrow. There really isn't. <laughs> I hope and, somebody wrote that down. Douglas uh, Goldman says he felt that he sold the family cow for three beans. Oh, I think oh, that's yeah. worth repeating it several oh, times. It was, oh, it was, you know, because Generation X was no overnight hit. No, I know. Oh, it went through this, like, just like all these people trying to club it to death along well, the way. Well, it began as a non-fiction book, did it? Was it not supposed to be a handbook? Well, there was this guy, Peter Livingston. Did you ever meet him? He, he was my agent for a while. So, yeah, you remember Peter. And he was a hustler. I mean, he was great. And uh, he had sort of sold it on a phone call to uh, Jim Fitzgerald down at uh, St. Martin's Press. And I, mean, I don't even think we signed anything that said what the book would actually be. And, and there was this moment, I've talked about it a million times, but it really did happen uh, in the fall of 88, about a month after I quit smoking, up at the Davisville subway station here in Metro Toronto. And it was the sunset and there had been a storm. And the, sc the sky was like the color of tangerine oranges and it was cold and very wet. And, and I was standing outside the Golden Griddle, which is now gone, and, and it was like, oh, this voice. And I, I don't, I believe in schizophrenia, but I don't believe in voices per se, but there was a voice, it was external, it was not mine, I don't know where it came from, what it was, and it's never really come back since, but it said, okay, here's the deal, you're writing now, so you have to put away everything you've done before and you can't do it, and you have to write fiction, and that's the way it is. And so just when I got to this point in my life where I could like barely get my shit together, I had to throw it all away and start from scratch again. So, you know, guarantees. And even then when I did it, it was like club, club, try and kill it, the club to death. So it, it was, it, it, at no point, you know, did the limousine with Kiss show up at the front door and say, let's go out and party, okay? <laughs> that must have been a great disappointment to you. Oh, you know, this is the expression a old editor at New York said, like, when you, after you publish a book, it's the calm after the calm. <laughs> that's, that's perfect. Okay, uh, another short question. Is, why is there not a telephone book? This, this comes up in this book. Why is there not a, a, a yellow pages or a white pages that contains everybody's email or their cell phone numbers? Do we still think of, the, of email and, and, and uh, uh, cell phones as, as, private, as um, things we can be anonymous on? Is that why we don't want to publish that stuff? Funny you should ask that question now, because next week Angus Reid gets your cell phone number. Oh, really? Yeah, and there's a list you can sign if you don't want them to. Oh, of course, yeah. So it, that still exists. Um, my personal beef is white pages and yellow pages. I think it's a crime that they're still being printed, the crime that they're killing trees to print them, it's pathetic. Um, they should be thrown away tomorrow. Um, but why, why, are, why is your cell phone number never listed? You, don't, you have to pay to have your landline unlisted, <laughs> but you pay nothing to, I don't know. That's actually the best story that no one's ever written. I'd love to know the answer, do you know? No, 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 okay. I, I, I was looking to you for a well, flash all these, of brilliance. There's all these fresh young kids from Humber College here who you know, probably have a dissertation or something to write. And there you go, kids, there's a good idea. <laughs> and, and if you don't seize it, it will show up in his next novel. So, so please. It all goes into the crock pot. In, yeah. into, the, into the crock pot? Yeah. That's what you're calling the, the me? The stew, yeah. The receptacle now, the yeah. crock pot? Yeah. No, no, actually, the crock pot's outside of myself. Uh, not a hand, but no, no. I, I like to think of my head as a nice, big, calm, quiet room with good lighting. I do. 